Today, we're going to cover chapter 18 in your textbook, Redox Reactions. This material will be the only chapter, the only material covered on the next exam, which will occur uh, during final exam week on a week from today. Um, this coming Thursday, this is a Tuesday, this coming Thursday, we'll review this material and work some problems in the review document. Okay, so let's introduce some material here. All right, redox reaction. Okay, those are the topics we're going to cover. They're not that many, so we can we can take our time and work through them slowly. So what is an oxidation reduction reaction? An oxidation reduction reaction that we call redox, because it sounds better than ox red, is any chemical reaction that involves the transfer of electrons. Believe it or not, some chemical reactions do not transfer electrons, uh, but many do. And those are the ones we're going to study today. Our example here is we're reacting sodium with chlorine gas. Okay. And it produces sodium chloride. Table salt. Okay. Let's see. We need to balance this, don't we? Two of those. That means two here. So we're balanced. Remember when we were studying the uh, nomenclature, how to name compounds? We assumed that all of the alkaline metals, the ones, the members of sodium's group, alkaline metals, have a plus one charge. That's when they're in a compound. Right? So this compound will have a plus one charge on that sodium. But this one, is a pure metal. It's elemental. Its charge is zero. Okay. We also said that halogens, most of them, uh, when especially when they're combined with a metal, will be a minus one charge. Okay. And that one is a zero charge. Well, how did it get that charge? How did this one get a minus charge and this one got a plus charge? Remember when you when you assign a charge to an atom, it is the result of a gain or a loss of electrons. You cannot mess with the protons, remember. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. So you have to add or subtract electrons. Well, that's exactly what happens during this chemical reaction. We have an electron from here transferred. This is one electron per atom. So since there are two atoms here and two atoms there, that requires two electrons. Okay. <clears throat> when that happens, each one of these gets an extra electron, which is responsible for the negative charge. Each one of these loses an electron which now is responsible for the positive charge. That's the whole thing about redox reactions. It's a balance and a movement of electrons. <clears throat> we give names to these. Whenever one loses an electron, we call it oxidation. So sodium had to lose electrons. That means it was oxidized. And chlorine gained electrons, it was reduced. You can think of it this way, at least for the reduction side. When you go from a zero to a minus one, you've reduced the number. You've gone from zero, you've gone negative. Right? You've reduced. You've reduced the number. Uh, if we started out at a positive three and we went to uh, a 
plus one, it would also be reduced from a plus three to a plus one. You're decreasing the number. <clears throat> okay. So that's what reduction is. There's a mnemonic on the next page to help you remember what this means. Okay. It's oil rig. Right. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. And that's in reference to the electrons. Oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain of electrons. And there we have a picture of it. That's called the mnemonic device. Each letter of the words represents another word that you're trying to remember. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain. All right. So let's look at a let's look at a problem and use what we've learned to describe what's happening in this reaction. Okay, in this reaction, 102, which is SN2 plus, is what? Is it oxidized or reduced? Well. Let's see, iron three plus, like that. And then 10 becomes four plus, and iron becomes two plus. Okay, so the way this is written, and uh, I'll make a point of this right now. Notice that these charges across the reaction don't necessarily balance. Uh, we have, well, let's see, we have uh, two, six plus, eight plus, okay, two, four, four. Okay, so the positive charge is balanced. Eight plus on this side and eight plus on that side. But they don't have to. Um, and we've also left out the anions, right? If this were just positive charges in this reaction, you'd have static charge, right? And chemical reactions don't have, typically have, a buildup of static charge. So what we've done is we've left out the negatives, right? This could be something like uh, 10 2 chloride. This could be uh, iron 3 chloride. Uh, we left out the negative ions because they're just spectators. They're not involved in the transfer of electrons. So how did we get from 2 plus to 4 plus? I draw a connector line like that. So how did we get from a two plus to a four plus? Did we add electrons or lose electrons? If we went more positive, we had to lose negatives. We had to lose electrons. So there was a loss of two electrons for every 10, right? And there's only one 10, right? So that's, uh, excuse me. So if we only have one 10, that means two electrons total were lost in this process. What is that? Right, oil rig. Oxidation is loss. Right? So 10 two is oxidized. Well, while we're here, what happened to iron? Well, uh, this is a, a cardinal rule that we use in studying oxidation reductions, they always occur together. You never have an oxidation without a reduction, vice versa. Okay, so if 10 2 plus has lost or been oxidized, that means iron must have been reduced. Right? It had to gain. What did it gain? Well, it went from a three plus to a two plus. So the number got smaller, right? Instead of three, it's a two plus. So it gained one electron for every iron. But we have two irons. 
two electrons. So two electrons total were gained, while two, ele two electrons total were lost. That's another rule. The same, the number of electrons that are lost must always equal the number of electrons gained in a chemical reaction. All right. So, in this case, each one of these was an ion, a simple elemental ion. So, it was easy to follow the change in their charges. But uh, some reactions occur in which you don't have charges uh, change, right? You may have a, a complex ion or um, a neutral compound. So how do we keep track of the electron movement when we don't know a charge? Well, we've developed this system, a bookkeeping scheme called oxidation states. Um, sometimes the oxidation state is equal to the charge but not always. And we need rules, of course, to determine the oxidation state of each atom in a reaction so that we can track the movement of electrons. And that's what we're gonna do next. We're gonna cover those rules. All right. Rule number one, <laughs> easy one first. Oxidation state of an atom in its elemental form is zero. Like, you, like we did with sodium and chlorine. Sodium oxidation state was zero, right? In its most stable form at room temperature and one atmosphere pressure, it has an oxidation state of zero. It also has a, a charge of zero. And then chlorine, this is its most stable form as a diatomic element. In that case, its oxidation state is also zero. All right. Next, if there's an ion involved, its charge is the oxidation state. So when we wrote 10 to plus, that is its oxidation state. There's only one element there and it has a charge. So that is its oxidation state. Now we're gonna get into compounds. When oxygen is in a covalent compound, we give it an oxidation state of minus two. And that's the same that it has when it's combined with uh, a metal in an ionic compound, right? Um, for instance, water. That's a covalent compound. There are no, there are no um, ions in this. They're covalently bound uh, in this molecule, right? So what's the oxidation state of oxygen? We give it a minus two. Okay, uh, one exception to that rule, if oxygen is bound to another oxygen and then to some, something else, um, say like this, like this, and then it has some other groups covalently bound to it, then these two oxygens together have a two minus oxidation state, which means each one of them has a one minus. That's called a peroxide. And they always have that minus one oxidation state. Okay, while we're here, since oxygen has a two minus and uh, compounds must be, this is a neutral compound, then we have to add the the oxidation states just like we would charges and make them equal to zero. So this hydrogen would have to be just one plus, 
two times this one is two plus, and then two minus, that's a zero. Okay? I think that's the next rule. Hydrogen in covalent compounds is given an oxidation state of plus one. Now, the exception to that one is when hydrogen is bound to a metal. When hydrogen is bound to a metal, the metal wants to give up an electron more easily than hydrogen does. So hydrogen is obligated to accept that charge or that oxidation condition. So our example there is aluminum hydride. Okay. So here we have a metal with hydrogen. In this case, aluminum is a three plus. That means each one of these hydrogens has to be a one plus. Okay. But when hydrogen is combined with the nonmetals, it's in a covalent compound and it's always a plus one. All right. Fluorine is always given a minus one oxidation state. Uh, whether it's in a covalent compound or it's uh, combined with a metal, it's always minus one. Um, and on that topic, if you look at the periodic table that's in the review document, you will see uh, it, with each element, uh, whatever the element is, there will be numbers up here in the upper right hand corner. Those numbers refer to oxidation states. Those are the most common oxidation states for that element when it's in combination with other elements. Uh, and you'll find that when it's fluorine, that's it. It's only a minus one, nothing else. But with other halogens like chlorine and bromine, they will have several different possible oxidation states. And we'll speak about those in a minute. The sum of the oxidation states for a neutral compound must always be zero. If you have a polyatomic ion, then the oxidation states of all the elements in the, com in the uh, uh, ion must add up to its charge. So we did water earlier. If we do the nitrate polyatomic ion, oxygen, we have given it a minus two, right? So we have two times three is a minus six total. So what would nitrogen have to be in order to make this one a minus one? Well, it's a plus five, right? A plus five and a minus six is a minus one. The way I do it to find that plus five is I say, okay, I only need to neutralize minus fives because one of those has to be held out for this charge. That means that this minus five must be balanced by this plus five. Okay? That's the way I like to do it. Fewer mistakes that way. All right. We also give uh, some of the metals uh, a fixed oxidation states. Alkaline metals, the first column in the periodic table is occupied by alkal alkaline metals, and they're always plus one. Their next door neighbors, the alkaline earths, that would be uh, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, uh, barium, they're all plus two. Oxidation states. Now, sometimes you have um, elements in combination in which each of the elements could have multiple oxidation states, the possibility. So unless we assign oxidation states in those cases, 
we're stuck. We can't calculate the, the unknown oxidation state. For example, PCL5. Okay. Chlorine could be minus one, it could be uh, plus three, it could be plus five. Okay. So what we do is we assign when chlorine is in a covalent compound with another nonmetal like this, then chlorine is assigned automatically a minus one. Okay, that makes it possible to calculate the phosphorus, right? Because five times minus one is minus five. That means this one phosphorus has to be a plus five. Okay. The other way to tell which one to set as a fixed uh, oxidation state is which one is to the right and above in the periodic table. So if we say the periodic table is like this, like this, like that, like that, like that, and we have uh, non-metals over here and metals over here, then the trend in the table is from lower left to upper right, you have an increasing quality called electronegativity. And that just means that the atoms um, of, of the elements, the elements uh, up here have a very much stronger attraction for electrons than elements down here. So the trend is if it's to the right, it has it's more electronegative. If it's above, it's more electronegative. That's why lower left to upper right. So we use that trend. You notice that phosphorus is located in, uh, in this region here, and chlorine is over here. Right? Chlorine is to the right, it's more electronegative. So we assign it that negative one charge. Okay, it doesn't have a positive charge, that's negative. That way, we can fix this one and calculate that one. Let's take another example carbon and nitrogen in the cyanide ion. Um, so carbon is here, let's see, right here, and nitrogen is right here. Okay. So nitrogen is to the right. It's more electronegative. That means we fix its charge at a minus three. Why? Because oxygen and fluorine are right there. Right. Um, I didn't do the noble gases over here because they don't have charges or oxidation states, typically. Uh, although that's, that's not entirely true. Some of the... Um, Noble gases can be forced to form compounds, but we're not going to worry about those right now. Anyway, back to the topic. Um, since nitrogen is to the right of carbon, and this is, would be a minus one, this would be a minus two, nitrogen then is a minus three. And then we calculate carbon, right? So if, if this one's a minus three, and we hold one out for that charge, then carbon only has to be a plus two. Okay, that's how we get around that problem of which one do you pick? All right. <clears throat> if you want to read more about um, electronegativities, I think that topic is covered in chapter 12. And we didn't we didn't introduce chapter 12 in this class, but it's an interesting topic. And if you want to learn more, it's right there in your textbook. So let's see if we can calculate the oxidation states for these different compounds or polyatomic ions. Right. Let's see. Potassium dichromate. OK. All right, so let's go for the ones that we have assumed and fixed as a certain oxidation state, All right? Oxygen is two minus. That means seven times two minus is 
minus 14. Potassium is an alkaline metal. So it's, it's a one plus, that means it's two plus. And if we combine those two, we get a minus 12. That means chromium has to balance that minus 12. Since this is a neutral compound, we need 12 positives. So this one has to be positive 12, but there are two of them. So each one only has to be six pluses. All right. So we've done that. We've calculated chromium based on what we have assumed for oxygen and potassium. Now, how about the carbonate ion? Okay. We know that this one is going to have to add up to a two minus charge. So minus two for each of the oxygens times three is minus six. But we need to keep two of those negatives out from that charge. So we really only have to balance that minus four. That means plus four for the carbon. Okay. Oops, getting ahead of myself. All right, MnO2. All right, this is a minus two times two is a minus four. This is a neutral compound, so this one has to be a plus four. Okay. We did PCL5 already, right, on that previous slide. Right, we assigned chlorine as a minus one. That means phosphorus has to be a plus five. How about this one, sulfur tetrafluoride? Well, we know that fluorine is assigned a minus one charge. So minus four total, this one has to balance it with a plus four. Right. So it's kind of like uh, a charges, but it's not really charges for everything because um, polyatomic ions and uh, most of these compounds, well, manganese, Dioxide, of course, is an ionic compound, so it's probably the charge there. But um, the oxidation state bookkeeping scheme allows us to assign oxidation states, whether it's covalent or ionic, doesn't matter. All we're interested in doing is tracking electrons, and the oxidation states allow us to do that, and that's where we're headed next. So there we have our previous example. So what are the oxidation states? Well, we did zero for sodium, zero for chlorine because they're elements, neutral elements in their most stable form. Sodium is an alkali metal plus one. That makes chlorine a minus one. All right. So sodium has to be oxidized. And uh, there's another term that we're introducing now. So if we say that we have two sodiums and the chlorine yields two sodium chloride, if we say that oxygen, I mean sodium, goes from a zero to a plus one and chlorine goes from a zero to a minus one, then sodium has to be oxidized, right? And chlorine has to be reduced. Okay. But since they always occur together, that means sodium, when it's oxidized, it causes the reduction of chlorine. That means it is a reducing agent. Right. It is the cause of that reduction. That means the chlorine can also be called the oxidizing agent. Because it caused the oxidation of sodium. All right. A little bit about terminology there. So when we talk about an oxidizing agent, the oxidizing agent itself must be reduced.
Okay, so here's another example. What are we going to do with this one? We're going to assign oxidation states first. All right. Well, there they come. Okay, they're already there for us. So we've calculated the oxidation states. Do the easy one first, right? The elements are always zero, so oxygen zero. Water, minus two for oxygen, plus one for the hydrogens. Uh, carbon dioxide, minus two for the oxygens, means that carbon has to be a plus four to balance those two minus twos. And then methane is minus four and plus one. Uh, I'm going to draw those up there anyway. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, water, right? and we could very easily have balanced this equation using our budget method, right? And I think we did at one time do that. Okay, so we've assigned oxidation states. Two minus, one plus, uh, two minus, four plus, zero, uh, one plus, and four minuses, okay? So let's draw our connectors. Right? Carbon went from a minus four to a plus four. So what does that mean? That means it had to lose electrons, but how many? Well, the easiest way to do that is how many does it take to get to zero? You lose four to get to zero, right? Lose four more, you get to four plus. So that's eight electrons. So carbon has, has a loss of eight electrons for each carbon. And there's only one of them. Right? So which one was, if carbon was oxidized, it must be responsible for the reduction. It's a reducing agent for oxygen. Oxygen went from here to here, and to here. Fortunately, we went from zero to two minus on both of them. So we can put the same connector in each one. Right, so this oxygen, when it went from zero to two minus, it gained two electrons for each oxygen. Per oxygen, and how many oxygens do we have? We have four, right? Two times two is four. There are two of them, and there are the other two. Equals eight electron, right? So carbon lost eight electrons, and oxygen got them. Oxygen gained those eight electrons. All right. Okay, so this is just a review. Redox characteristics, they always transfer electrons. Uh, transfers can form ions, but they don't have to. Oxidation is a loss of electrons, which makes the, the one that loses electrons causes the reduction of something else, which makes it a reducing agent. Reduction is a decrease in oxidation state. It reduces its oxidation number, decrease, by gaining electrons, and it then becomes the oxidizing agent. All right. A little animation in there. Okay, which of the following are oxidation reduction reactions and identify the oxidizing agent, the reducing agent. All right, so there we have our three reactions. And we're gonna look at each one in turn. Up to this point, we've only looked at reactions that we knew beforehand were oxidation reductions. But now we're going to use our uh, bookkeeping scheme 
to determine which ones really are oxidation reduction reactions. All right, so the first one, we have zinc metal plus what? Hydrochloric acid. This is a solid 2HCl in aqueous solution yields zinc chloride. I think there are two of those, aren't there? Yes. And then we have uh, hydrogen gas. Okay. Now let's see. That's balanced. Okay. That's a sign oxidation states. Zero for the element. Hydrogen is plus one, chlorine is a minus one. Here we have to decide. Chlorine, when it's combined with a metal, is always minus one. Right. So that means two of these means. This one is a two plus, and that's a zero. Okay. Now we've assigned oxidation states. We can say, uh, is this an oxidation reduction reaction? Yes, it is. We have gone from zero here, two plus there. We've gone from plus one to zero here. Right. So this is a redox reaction. Okay. Which one is the oxidizing agent? It's the one that was reduced. Which one was reduced? We went from a plus one to a zero for hydrogen, adding an electron. This one is reduced. So it's the oxidizing agent. Okay. That makes this one oxidized. And it's the reducing agent. Okay. Let's see. All right, there we're going to get our oxidation states. There we go. Here we go. That is a redox reaction. Now the red one, we're color coded here. The red one is the reducing agent. Okay. The blue one will be the oxidizing agent. Okay, so let's do the next one. Uh, let's see. And here, notice that we've uh, eliminated some of the spectators. The hydroxide will have a cation with it. The dichromate ion will have a cation with it, right? To balance all the charges. Uh, but they're not essential. They're only spectators, so we leave them out. So the dichromate is combined with hydroxides to yield Chromate plus water. Okay. So, um, oxygen here is a two minus, and this is a one plus. How about this one? Four times uh, minus two is minus eight. We have to hold two of them out, so it's minus six. This is a plus six. Okay, uh, hydrogen here is a plus one. Oxygen is minus two. So that gives us a minus one for that polyatomic ion. That one's good. Uh, this one is a minus two times seven is minus 14. We did this one before. So we're holding two out there. It's minus 12, plus 12 total, plus six. So did we have any transfer of electrons here? The answer is no. We did not. We had no. So this is a non redox. That's where we stop. It's not a redox reaction, so we can't have an oxidizing agent. We can't have a reducing agent. All right. So there's there are assignments. 
and it's not an oxidation reduction reaction. How about the last one? Let's see, let me make some room here. Let's see, we've got um, two CuCl in aqueous solution yields CuCl2 in aqueous solution plus copper metal. Okay, so this one's obviously going to be a zero. Okay, minus one for chlorine. That means this copper must be a two plus. Okay. This one is still minus one. That means this one is a plus one. So what happened here? Well, notice we got two uh, copper one chlorides here. One of them produced that, and the other one produced that. So we go here. What happened there? We went from a plus one to a plus two. So there was a loss of one electron for every copper. Well, we got, well, there's only one copper that went that way. Uh, the other copper went this way. And this one gained one electron. If it gains one negative, it makes it zero. So we gain one electron per copper. And so we balance the charges, total one electron each. But for this one compound, we went two directions at the same time. This is a redox reaction. In fact, it's a special kind. We call it a big word, disproportionation. That's a disproportionation reaction. Okay, we sign our values, uh, our, our oxidation states, and we determine that it is a redox reaction. And then one thing I didn't do was say, all right, <laughs> what's the oxidizing agent? Well, copper one chloride is. What's the reducing agent? Copper one chloride is. <laughs> it's both oxidizing and reducing agent. The same molecule itself would not be both oxidizing and reducing, but we've got two of them there. So one of them is the oxidizing agent and the other one is the reducing agent. Now, if you're a if you're a miner, you're a smelter, and you're trying to isolate copper from ore, if it's made out of copper chloride, one of the things you will do is grind it into a fine powder and then heat it. And adding that heat causes this reaction to go. Uh, or you add a catalyst. Uh, since this is an aqueous solution, it's probably uh, we add a catalyst because once you heat it up to a certain temperature, it's, it's going to boil off. And so um, they probably add a catalyst, maybe increase the temperature some, and you get this disproportionation reaction, and you can get some copper out of this process. And then you take the copper chloride, copper two chloride, um, over here, and run it through a different process to get the rest of the copper. Okay, so we do have two oxidation reduction reactions here. Now there's a clue. Sometimes this clue works, sometimes it doesn't. But if you have a reaction in which there is an element on one side and you find it in a compound on the other side, that is an oxidation reduction reaction. Or here, you find this hydrogen in a compound here, now it's an element on this side. That is an oxidation reduction reaction every time. If you have that clue available, then you know it's an oxidation reduction reaction. Like here, right? you have this compound. Now you have copper as an element over here. That's definitely an oxidation reduction reaction. All right. So let's make room for some more.
Okay. Now, we have learned balance equations using a budget method. And very often that works just fine. But for oxidation reduction reactions, sometimes you're not given everything that needs to be in the reaction. Right? There may be other participants, other compounds or elements or ions that need to be in that reaction, and they're not given to you. So you can't balance it with the budget method because you don't have everything you need. So we have this method, this half reaction method, that uh, compensates for that problem. Okay, a half reaction is simply half of the reaction that is responsible for oxidation and the other half reaction written separately is responsible for the reduction. Okay. So here's a, a complete reaction that's balanced for us. This is just to illustrate the half reaction concept. Right, we have eight hydrogen ions, which means this is acidic solution, right? If we have hydrogen ions there, then we're in an acidic solution. Then we have this manganate ion, MnO4 minus, uh, as a reactant, and we have um, iron two plus as a reactant. Products are manganese ion two plus, the iron three plus now, not two plus, and water, okay? So which one belongs where? Well, we do the oxidation states first. We have to find out what components need to go in the oxidation step and which ones need to go in the reduction step. So to do that, we assign oxidation numbers, all right? And then we also have to be mindful of where the oxygens and hydrogens need to go, right? They don't need to go with, let's see, there it is. They don't need to go with the iron because the iron goes from here to here, and there's no oxygen here with iron, and there's no oxygen there with iron, there's no hydrogen there. So the oxygens and hydrogens are going to go with the manganate wherever it goes. Right? That's what's next. So the reduction step takes the, the manganese plus seven and carries it to manganese plus two. And then you've got oxygen on the manganate side, you need oxygen on the product side, but now you've added hydrogen on the product side, you gotta balance those with hydrogen on the reactant side. And that's where those other eight hydrogens go in. Okay. So that gives us, um, the reduction step. What we're missing is the number of electrons because when we do it this way, when we write these half reactions, we have to account for the electrons also. And there they are. So those five electrons were added to, that. What, that's what reduction means. Those five electrons were added to that manganese seven plus and neutralized five of them. So now you only have two pluses left over and that's where they are right here with this manganese, right? Those five minuses neutralized five of those and left us with only two pluses remaining. Okay, now we do the same thing for the, for the irons. There's a two plus for that iron. There's a three plus for that iron. And where do the electrons go? Well, the iron plus two lost an electron, but there are five irons. So it lost five electrons. Right. So notice that, that those electrons are on the right-hand side of the arrow. They are products. Oxida oxidation is lost. Those electrons were lost from this side. Now they're showing up on the product side. And notice that these five electrons on the product side balance these five electrons on the reactant side. Okay. Now let's take an equation that's not balanced and use the half reaction method to balance it, right? 
Um, these are steps that we're going to follow in just a minute. And I only put them up there so that they would be uh, recorded. Right. We're going to identify which elements are oxidized, which are reduced. And that way we'll know which ones need to go into their separate reduction or oxidation equations. Then once they, we get them in the half reactions, you balance all the elements except hydrogen and oxygen. Then you balance the oxygens with water on the opposite side of the equation. And when you add water, of course you add hydrogens, you bring the hydrogens back over on the, the other side so that you can balance those. Okay. That means that you're in an acidic solution. Now, naturally, you may be thinking, all right, um, what if the solution is basic? Right? It's not acidic. Okay, we're going to deal with that. But we need to learn the acidic method first. Then once you get that balanced, you check the number of electrons transferred in each of the half reactions. And you've got to reconcile those to be sure that you have the same number of electrons in the oxidation step as you do in the reduction step. And the way you do that is you multiply the entire equation through by some constant. So we're going to do one. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Once you get the, the final electrons balanced, then you can add the equations back together and cancel terms. All right. So uh, example, here we go. So we've got this example, the dichromate ion. plus the sulfite ion, right? We've left out spectators, obviously. Yield chromium three plus, plus sulfate, okay? Now they're all the aqueous solution. That's why I didn't write aqueous up there. All right, let's assign oxidation uh, numbers. This one's already good. That charge on that single element, that is its oxidation state. Uh, Oxygen is minus two times four is minus eight. We're going to hold two of those negatives out for that two negatives. That means we only need to balance a plus six on the sulfur. Okay, let's do this side. Minus two for oxygen, minus six total. We're going to hold two of them out for that charge, that means this one is plus four. All right. Now we have minus two. We did this one before, All right? This is a plus six. I don't have to do that one again. All right. What's the oxidation step? Who was oxidized? Sulfur went from plus four to plus six. Oxidation is loss. It lost two electrons. Okay, so our half reaction for oxidation step is the sulfite ion yields the sulfate ion. Okay, now how about the reduction step? Well, the only thing that left is, is chromate, dichromate. Okay, and it yields chromium three plus. Okay, now let's balance the the chromiums here. We need two chromiums over there right? because we've got two there. We got one sulfur, one sulfur. Right, so the non-oxygen, non-hydrogens are balanced. Now we go for the oxygens. We got three oxygens here and four oxygens there. So where does the oxygen go? On the left-hand side, right? We just need one oxygen. One plus three is four, four. But now we have two hydrogens there. Okay, so now that much is done. 
Here we have seven oxygens. So we got to put seven oxygens on this side as water. Now we have 14 hydrogens. Okay, so now those are balanced. Now we need to do electrons. If this is the oxidation step, where do the electrons go? They have to go on the product side, right? For one sulfur, we went from plus two to plus six, so we lost two electrons for each sulfur. Now about chromium. Chromium went from plus six to plus three, so we gained three electrons for each chromium. Oh, but there are two chromiums. That means we need six. Here we go. Now <clears throat> we reconcile the two for the number of electrons. This has six, that has two. What multiplier will give you six here? Our multiplier is three. Okay, so three here, three here, three here, three times two is six, three times two is six. So now we have the same number of electrons in this equation, in this equation, we can bring them together. All right, let's write them in the same orders up here. So the dichromate ion, and then plus three sulfites. Then what else do we have? We have three water. We have 14 hydrogens, and we have six electrons. That takes care of this side. Now let's do the other side. We have two. Chromium three plus, we have three sulfates. Okay, now we have waters plus seven water, right? Six hydrogens and six electrons. Okay, now we can cancel, right? We have the same number of electrons on both sides, right? That takes care of electrons. How about hydrogens? We have 14 on this side and six on that side. So these six go away and subtract six from this is eight. Okay. How about water? Well, we got three waters on this side and seven on this side. So now this becomes four. Okay. So our balanced equation is one dichromate, three sulfites, eight hydrogens, two chromium three plus, three sulfates, four waters on the product side. And that's what, that's what we're gonna do uh, in this animated version here. Separate into half reactions. Right? Okay, that was our reduction step. Now the oxidation step. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> Here we go. That's how far we've gotten on the first one. Balance the oxygens. Okay, seven waters. All right. Balance the hydrogen ions in acidic solution. Here we go. 14 of those, and then balance the hydrogens here. Okay, next slide. Now we balance the electrons next. There we go, six electrons there. Two there. So we need their multiplier to reconcile the number of electrons. Okay, three times that one. OK. 
Okay, now we can add them together. And cancel terms. And there's our final, our final balanced equation. And notice that what we did was we went from here to this one, which now includes the hydrogen term and the water term that was not in the original. We could not balance the first equation, the original equation, using our budget method because we didn't know where the waters and the hydrogens go. All right. How about this one? Um, when this reaction is balanced, the coefficient in front of the cerium 2 plus is what? Let's see, we have a selection. Yeah, we have a selection. All right. Now, if you've got hydrogens and oxygens to deal with, the half reaction method is the way to go. But if you have uh, the beginning, the first equation has no oxygens in it, no hydrogens in it, then you can do it without breaking it apart into half reactions. And I'll show you how that works. Let me see. I've got something in my way here. I need to see. Okay, that's that's pure cobalt. Okay. So if we take Ce2 plus and cobalt 2 plus, and that yields Ce3 plus and cobalt metal. Notice we have no oxygen, no hydrogen here. So we just need to determine what's the oxidation state. Well, obviously two plus, two plus, three plus, and zero. So what happened to, the, to this cerium when it went from there to there? It had to lose an electron, right? Loss one electron per cerium, okay? Cobalt then went from here to here, and it was a gain, gain two electrons per cobalt. Okay. Now, how are we, how are we going to balance this one? Well, since we don't have hydrogens or oxygens to deal with, all we need to do is be sure that we have the same number of electrons in the oxidation step as we do in the reduction step. Here we've got two electrons per cobalt. Here we have one electron per cerium. We need two electrons. So we need a times two equals two electrons, which means a two here and a two there. And that balances the equation. So the coefficient in front of Ce2 plus is, come on, oh. There we go happens to be two. And that equation is balanced. Now, obviously in this case, we did not include the spectator ions. Right? There were some uh, anions associated with these right, of some kind, uh, but we didn't include them because they had no bearing on the oxidation reduction steps. All right, let's see how we're doing. Uh, if I got enough time. We should be okay. I'm about halfway and we've used up an hour. Balance the following oxidation reduction reaction that occurs in acidic solution. Okay, I can do that. We can do that. Br minus and then manganate. Oops, that's not right. Manganate. These are all aqueous, correct? Oh, there's bromine liquid, so I better mark it off. Aqueous 
aqueous and Br2 as a liquid, and then Mn2 plus aqueous. Okay, so what do we do first? Oxidation states, right? We got to figure out which one's reduction, which one's oxidation, and we do have an oxygen here. So we're going to have to break it apart into uh, half reactions. This one's a minus one. This one's a minus two times four is minus eight. Hold one out, minus sevens. This is a plus seven. Okay. This one's a zero, and that one's a two, two plus. So now we can determine which is which. Okay. This bromine goes from a minus one to a zero. It had to lose electrons. Loss. One electron per bromine. This manganese went from plus seven to plus two. It gained five electrons per manganese. All right? So oxidation step, right? loss of electrons, oxidation. So we got bromine, uh, bromide ion yields bromine liquid, okay? Reduction step is manganate ion yields Mn2 plus ion, okay? Now let's balance the non-oxygen, non-hydrogens. There are two bromines on this side. We need two on this side. Now we can do oxygens. No problem up here. Four oxygens there. We need four oxygens on this side. Now we need eight hydrogens on this side, okay? Now we do electrons. Bromine, loss, one electron per bromine, loss. But there are two bromines, so we actually lost two electrons. Gain five electrons per manganese, and there's only one manganese. So we gained five electrons, okay? Now we reconcile them. How do you get two electrons and five electrons to meet. The simplest way is use a math trick called cross multiplication. We take this two and use it as a multiplier here. And take this five and use it as a multiplier here. That will give us 10 electrons in each one. Okay, so this one becomes 10. This one is a five, and this one is 10. Two times this one, two there, use that up. Two there, two times eight is 16. Two times five is 10. Two here, and two times four is eight. Okay? Now, uh, balance the equation. Okay. Before we add them together, why don't we just cancel terms, right? We've got uh, 16 hydrogens here. Do we have any over there? No. Okay. We got 10 electrons. We can get rid of the electrons. 10 and 10. How about water? That's it. So now we can add them together. All right, so let's put them in order. 10 Br minus, and then two Mn O4 minus. There we have 16 hydrogens. Okay, one, two, three, one, two, three. And then we have bromine liquid. Uh, five of them. There we go. Then we have two manganese two plus, and we have eight waters. 
So there's your balanced equation. And you can check it and say 10 bromines. Yep, 10 bromines, two manganese, two manganese, eight hydrogens. Uh, excuse me. Uh, oxygen, excuse me, eight oxygens. Eight oxygens, 16 hydrogens, 16 hydrogens. So we know it's balanced now. And the animation should take us through those steps. There's our reduction, there's our oxidation. Then we're going to balance the numbers of bromines. Okay. All right, we're doing electrons first. That's okay. You can do them out of order. Get the electrons done. And then we'll balance the oxygens. Okay. Add water on that side and the hydrogens on the other side. For the next step, there we go, eight hydrogens. All right, then we balance electrons with our multipliers. And then we add them together. And that looks like it. Oh, we didn't get rid of the electrons. <laughs> get rid of the electrons. And there we go. That's our final balanced equation. Okay. What if the reaction occurs in basic solution? Well, let's see. We're going to use this equation, aren't we? 2MnO4, 10Br minus 16 hydrogens, 5Br2s, 2Mn's. Okay. We're going to use this reaction and say, okay, what if instead of acidic reaction, which is what we mean by this right here, what if it's in basic solution where we use, we have hydroxyls in excess of hydrogen ions? Well, what you do now is once you've got the acid equation balanced, you just convert it into basic. And here's how you do it. You neutralize all of those hydrogens with an equal number of hydroxyls. So what does that give you? Right? OH plus H plus yields water. So we get 16 waters out of this, right? HOH. 16 waters. Well, we added hydroxyls on this side. We got to add hydroxyls on the other side too. 16 hydroxyls. There we go. Right? Anything you do to one side, you got to do to the other. All right, so these are going on now. There's 16 waters. But we've got eight waters on that side, 16 on this side. So these waters go away. And now these are reduced to eight. Now that solution is, that equation is balanced for basic solution. There we go. All right, now what does that make? There we go. There's your waters. And right. Cancel the waters. Now we have only eight waters on the left, 16 hydroxyls on the right. And that was our balanced equation. So I call that the fake acid method. <laughs> you, you balance it for an acidic solution first, then you neutralize the acid with hydroxyls on both sides of the equation. And your, the outcome is a basic solution. All right. Okay, um, we've learned how to uh, balance equations using the half reaction method. Once we've separated those half reactions apart like that, um, we can do something with them, actually. We don't have to separate them on the board. We can set, 
separate them in real life. We can separate those two reactions into two separate containers. Electrochemistry is the study of the conversion of chemical energy into electrical energy, the movement of electrons through a conductor. Right? There are two types of processes. The first one is spontaneous. That is, once you, once you connect that, um, those half reactions together and you make a complete circuit, then electrons will start moving, right? just like they would if you put two solutions together. Only the problem with putting those two solutions together and letting the reaction run is you don't have access to those moving charges, those electrons. You can't gain any, any energy from them, any work from them. So that's why we separate them into two uh, half cells and we make the electrons go external to the half cells to get from one to the other. While they're traveling, we can extract energy from them. And that's a spontaneous reaction. On the other hand, if we separate those two half reactions and we want the electrons to go the other direction, then we need to uh, put in between them a voltage source, a source of electricity that will drive the reaction, the electrons backwards, the way they don't want to go. Then you reverse the reaction. That's not spontaneous. So those are the two possibilities. So this electrochemical cell that we also call a galvanic cell. Named after an Italian, uh, I don't remember his first name, Galvani. Uh, he produced the first, what we normally consider today, a battery, but he called it a, a, a pile. And rightly so, he just had disks of copper and zinc. Just stacked up like that, alternating. And in between them were um, wet cloths with a, uh, an ionic solution in them, like potassium chloride or sodium chloride, something that would transfer charge. And then all they would have to do is connect the two ends and get a spark between them as you pull them together. That completed the circuit. Remember, in physics, um, electricity moves in a circuit. As far as we're concerned, it has to be complete circle. So if you if you have those two half cells and you connect a wire to them, but you don't have anything else to connect the half cells together, nothing will happen. And I'll show you in just a second. So here we have this. Um, half cell, this uh, manganate ion to Mn2 plus on one side, and we're going to combine it with Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus plus electrons. So the first one, the blue one, is the reduction, right? And the red one with the iron is the oxidation. Okay. And this would be an example of the type of cell you would set up. You would put the, uh, in this case, we've put the, uh, I actually put them on the wrong side. Uh, by convention, the reduction goes on the right and the oxidation goes on the left. But we've switched them around. Uh, each one of these half reactions is occurring independently from the other one in its own half cell. So a half reaction goes in a half cell. And notice that um, on the left-hand side, you've got manganese is being reduced, uh, but uh, there's no metal involved, right? The electrode, that flat piece that goes into that solution is not involved in the reaction. So we typically use something that's inert, like platinum, uh, palladium, or, or uh, nickel chromium alloy, 
that won't react in this case with the particular um, uh, chemicals in that half cell. But if the electrode is uh, active, in other words, if it reacts, and it's part of the reaction, the half reaction, uh, then it's made out of the, the metal that's uh, in the half reaction. The iron, in this case, it's also, it's not a participant. So it's probably platinum also. Notice that iron two plus and iron three plus are both in solution. But the reactions that do occur, even if the electrode is not involved, the reactions that do occur, occur at the electrode. Because the electrode is where the electrons are either picked up or delivered to the solution. But notice, these two reactions cannot occur. Even though we've got a wire connected, we don't have a complete circuit. So how do you make a complete circuit? Well, to keep from building up charge, right, which would happen over time, we complete the circuit with some type of a bridge. Um, salt bridge is one way. We just put um, an ionic solution in that uh, bent tube, the salt bridge. Uh, potassium chloride would work, sodium chloride would work, depending on uh, what cations and anions are in the half cells, uh, try to make them compatible if possible. And then you plug the end so there's no wholesale mixing. You just have ion movement. That way you can have a complete circuit. Or the other possibility is put a porous disc between the two, right? In fact, the porous disc is more efficient. Right? It doesn't offer as much resistance to movement of ions. Um, there's there's uh, one case I'm going to show you in a minute where you don't need to separate the half cells like that. Because uh, if both reactions reactions share, the same solution for their reactions to occur, you don't need to separate them physically. Well, you do. The, the physical separation of the electrodes, yes, but they can be in contact with the same solution. And I'll show you that in just a minute. Okay, this galvanic cell then, um, the way it's, it's uh, set up there, you have electrons moving from the right to the left. But typically what we do is we write the uh, oxidation cell on the left-hand side and the reduction cell on the right-hand side. And the electrons then would be moving spontaneously from left to right. But let's just say you, you go behind the board and look at it in the other direction, then it's in the right direction. <laughs> it's in the right relationship. And these electrons that are flowing through that external wire now are accessible. We can get at that electric energy that's being uh, used to push those electrons. All right, terminology. The half cell, let's see, if we write it by convention here, and this is the oxidation side, This is the reduction side. This is called the anode. You got a wire going here. Maybe we've got a, a voltmeter in there to measure voltage. Okay, and then we have a salt bridge here. Okay, this oxidation side is where electrons are being produced. So as they're produced, they're picked up by this electrode and the electrons now are moving this direction. And then they're being delivered to this solution where they can reduce something, okay? <clears throat> this oxidation side is called the anode.
And wherever oxidation is occurring, that is always the anode. Where reduction is occurring, this is always the cathode. Now, how do I keep them apart? How do I know which one's which? Well, in this case, what's happening to the um, positive ions? If you have any positive ions here, they're being drawn to these negatives. So these are cations being drawn to the electrode. That's the cathode. On this side, you're, you're sending uh, electrons here and you're leaving behind positive charges. Right? So anions have to migrate. Uh, anions have to migrate into the solution to balance that unbalanced charge, that positive charge. So the anions move into the anode and the cathodes move into the and, and the cations move into the cathode side. That's how I keep them apart. All right. Okay. Now let's look at the second process. Suppose we stick in here and the, the push that drives those electrons is given in terms of volts, right? Um, half a volt, one volt, two volts, three volts, whatever, uh, and it can be measured in this thing right here. But if we, let's see, um, if we supply the voltage that pushes opposite to this one, then we can drive the electrons backwards. Now we can reverse the direction of the electron, the electron movement. Okay, if this voltage here, um, reverse voltage and forward voltage, if the reverse voltage then is greater than the forward voltage, we can drive that process backwards. When that happens, what's happening over here now? Electrons are moving that direction, right? And they're moving away, they're products. So this side now becomes the oxidizing side. Uh, oxidation. And this one becomes the reducing side, reduction. So now with electrolysis, electrolysis, oops, misspelled, there we go. In electrolysis, we're driving the reaction backwards. Now this one becomes oxidation, this one's reduction. And by convention, the oxidation side is always the anode. And the reduction side is the cathode. So for that reaction, when we drive it backwards, the, the, the half cell names reverse. Okay. Uh, one example where we do this is chrome plating a bumper. Right? If we have chromium, in solution uh, and uh, pair it with some other half reaction, then it may go forward. And the chromium then would go from chromium metal to chromium ions and give up their electrons. But we're gonna drive it backwards. And then the chromium in solution, chromium ions in solution are reduced and they're plated out on the bumper. So if you go to an antique car show, you'll see some of these older cars still have chrome plate bumpers, bumpers. And that's how they make them, by electrolysis. Okay. <coughs> Let's go back to uh, the galvanic cell battery and look at an example. The lead storage battery that most cars have now, 
uh, except for those that uh, are um, electric cars, they have lithium ion batteries. That's, that's a different chemistry. But the lead storage battery is under the hood of your car to provide energy to get your engine turning and to provide power for other accessories. Well, here's how it's made. The reaction at the anode, right, produces electrons as a product. Oxidation produces those electrons that move out and through an external circuit to the cathode. Right? So the anode reaction is lead, metal, sulfuric acid. Actually, this is concentrated sulfuric acid. And that produces uh, lead to sulfate. Actually, that's not an aqueous solution. That precipitates out. And two hydrogens and two electrons. Okay. So this is the oxidation step or the anode. <coughs> the cathode uses lead four oxide. Right? It's a solid. And it's also in sulfuric acid. Right? What does it produce? It produces the same thing. Produces the same product. Let's see. There it is. Uh, only we need, I've left out the electrons, two electrons and uh, two hydrogens. Produces this plus water. Okay. So notice that when we build the battery, we have an electrode made of pure lead, an electrode made of lead for oxide. Since they have the same common solution, we can put them in the same solution and not have a barrier between them. And that's the way batteries are built. Uh, lead acid batteries are built. Okay. No salt bridge is required. Uh, no, um, uh, no connection, no separation is required at all. The problem is that during this reaction, they both produce lead to sulfate, the solid. And where does it go? Well, the reaction occurs on the plates. Right? So you're going to have uh, a lead plate here and a lead to oxide plate there. Right? And you're connecting them there, and they there's in the solution, and the lead sulfate ends up on the plates, right? So that's when we, when it's, um, the lead acid battery is being discharged. It's acting as a battery. The spontaneous reaction produces um, two volts. Two volts for each one of the cells. And if you've ever noticed, uh, batteries under your hood have six cells. Right? for cars, for automobiles. So, and they're connected in series. When you connect these batteries, these cells in series, you add the voltage. So if you got six of them, one, two, three, four, five, six, that equals 12 volts. That's why your car battery is 12 volts. Okay, here's the problem. Well, you can, uh, the alternator that's connected to your engine, when it starts, when your engine starts running, the alternator produces a current that is converted from alternating to direct current. And then that current is used to drive these reactions backwards and rebuild those electrodes. Okay? When it does that, it happens at the plates. Those reactions occur at the plates. The problem is that these this lead to sulfate is never completely 
reconverted. There's always some left on the plates. Each time you charge, discharge and recharge, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So eventually, you get these plates coated with lead sulfate and um, the, uh, the charging direction cannot access the solution. The sulfuric acid solution is no longer available to get between the plate and the lead sulfate so that it can make the reaction occur. At that point, your battery is dead. It cannot be recharged. It's said to be sulfated out. Those are, that's evil words. When somebody tells you your battery is sulfated out, the only thing you can do is buy a new one. Okay. So there's the overall reaction. There's the diagram. You can see, you can see the two different plates, right? There's the electrolyte, the solution in between them. There's the lead metal grid here. And this green one, it represents the uh, lead four oxide plate. Now the geometry, the engineering of these batteries uh, is important for making them deliver lots of power. They won't deliver any more volts, but they'll deliver uh, uh, lots of cranking amps, they call it. Lots of movement at that voltage, it can move lots of current. Right? So you need, that's where we talk about amps. Um, and um, they're also more forgiving on recharge. Right? They're designed so that the solution can get at the plate and it's more difficult for the process to sulfate out your battery. Right? So the newer batteries are much better, longer lived because of that. Right? No need for a salt bridge or a forced membrane, right? Because the, the two plates, the two uh, anode and cathode uh, electrodes are in the same solution. All right. So here's a discussion. We mentioned volts. That's also known as electrical potential. And sometimes it's given a it's given an E for electromotive force. Right? That's what a volt is, electromotive force, pushing the electrons from the anode to the cathode. Okay. And I mentioned earlier, each one of these cells produ is, um, produces two volts. So if you string them together in series, so you have this one over here will be a lead, and this one over here will be another lead oxide. Then you string them together in series, and you add up the voltages then. So six cells would give you 12 volts. Um, so diesel engines need more, right? They may need 24 volts. And there are some uh, other types of motors uh, that need more cranking amps. So they may string uh, 12 cells together and make 48 volts. 12, that's 24. Uh, 24 cells together and make 48 volts. There are other types of batteries. Right, kind that we put in our flashlights. Um, there's an acid version and a basic version of the dry cell battery. Right, and these these are the uh, half reactions. Right, notice that the the uh, acid version actually the acid version doesn't include free protons. The acid version. Oops, excuse me. I need to go back. Right. The acid version has the protons here attached to that ammonia. So that's ammonium ion. There's where your, your acid is right there. And then there's a, a basic version, an alkaline battery. This is the one that you typically buy off the shelf. Right? And you'll hear it advertised that way. Ours is the strongest alkaline dry cell. Right? This is the reaction they're using.
All right. And this is the construction of the cell. Um, in this case, the anode is a participant in the reaction, the zinc shell of the battery. The dry cell battery here is the anode. So that's where electrons are being delivered. And then they're going externally and they're entering in this uh, graphite rod, which is a non-participant, but it delivers electrons to the cathode. Right? The cathode, well, is here and it's in this solution. And one other important point is, uh, we know that you can buy dry cell batteries in size D, size C. I've never seen a B, but they're uh, double A's and triple A's. They all deliver the same voltage, 1.5 volts, or a little more, maybe. Um, but it doesn't matter the size. Right? The size of the battery doesn't matter. So the voltage of this reaction is an intensive property, right? Remember, intensive properties don't matter what the size is or how much of it you have. So you get the same volt no matter how big the battery is. The difference is the bigger batteries last longer under the same load. Um, dry cell batteries don't contain the liquid electrolyte, but there is, it, there is a solution. In other words, electrons and ions must be allowed to move. If they can't move, then you can't get a voltage. The battery will not work. So we call them dry cells simply because the, uh, the material is sort of a, a wet paste. It doesn't, you poke a hole in it, it doesn't just flow out like water. There are lots of other types of batteries. Uh, this silver cell uh, is one that you'll find in uh, calculators, uh, hearing aids, uh, various other small devices. The mercury cell uh, used to be used for those same products, but now we, we don't find mercury cells because they're toxic. Right, there's a design of the... Uh, uh, let's see, is this a mercury cell? Yeah, it's a mercury cell. So the chemistry works. It's just, it produces, it's made of a toxic material. So they're not marketed anymore. Nickel cadmium batteries. You remember those? They're rechargeables. Right? That's what we used to have. That used to be the only type of rechargeable battery you could buy. Um, but they had a nasty habit. Nickel cadmium batteries had a, had a habit called um, memory. If you only discharged the battery halfway and then recharged it, then it reset its zero point at the place where you were half charged. So it was difficult to get it back down to zero and get a full charge on that battery. It had memory. It remembered where it was when you charged it the next time. So the only thing to do is, uh, I used to do this with a, with a uh, nickel cadmium battery I had in, in one of my razors. Believe it or not, I do use a razor for trimming. And uh, I would just turn it on and let it run and run till it's completely dead. And that set its, reset its memory down to zero. And then you could recharge it and get a full charge out of it. You only do that a few times before it finally uh, would not take a charge anymore for various chemical reasons and engineering reasons. Okay, now let's talk about corrosion. Corrosion is a spontaneous process. It will occur and it's associated, corrosion is associated with metals. Metals returning to some uh, form of compound, usually the oxide, sometimes the sulfide, sometimes the chloride, um, or a combination of the, of the above. But it's, it, we want the metal. The metal we want the metal for its basic properties, its strength, its ability to conduct uh, heat, for instance. Uh, we want the metal. 
right? We don't want the, the compound from which it was derived. So it's trying to go back to where it was. So in order to prevent that from happening, what we can do is we can provide a source of electrons to the metal so that it will be continually being uh, part of the cathode. We send electrons to the metal so it uh, defeats the purpose of the corrosion. Right? So iron, typically, if iron is exposed to oxygen, it will spontaneously produce rust. Okay? What we want to do is go back the other direction. We want to provide a return um, supply of electrons that will go back the other way and keep this from happening. Uh, that's not balanced yet, of course. Let's see. Um, let's see. Two, three, two. Yeah, that's balanced now. Um, some metals are very good at protecting themselves. Aluminum is one of those. That's why when you, when you, uh, if you discard an aluminum can, right, throw it out your window as you're driving by, that can's going to be there a hundred years from now. Now, aluminum is very reactive. It forms aluminum oxide very readily. In fact, it forms aluminum oxide so fast that it forms a sealing, a sealant on the surface of the aluminum. So no more oxygen can get through. That's why it lasts. Okay. So it, it has a self-protecting mechanism. Um, this is one way to protect an iron pipe is to uh, connect a more active metal. We let the magnesium um, be converted to its oxide and give up the electrons in the process and deliver those electrons to the pipe. That's called cathodic protection. That's one way to do it. Another way is to just paint it, right? Cover it with a coating that will keep the oxygen and water away from it, right? Another way is to form an alloy. So we do that with uh, iron to make stainless steel. We combine iron with chromium and make an alloy, stainless steel. Of course, this is gonna have some carbon in it too, right? You gotta have carbon to have steel, but we have chromium in there. Originally, chromium was added to steel in the weight percent of about 35 percent very high mass percent uh, now we use a lot less because we add other things in there that that help provide the same the same protections <clears throat> and other characteristics that we want in our steel um, but what happens is uh, this chromium oxidizes so fast that it forms a protective coat over the stainless steel. And it's so thin that uh, you don't even know it's there. Uh, you polish the steel, make it real shiny, and you think that you're looking at the, the, the steel, the iron underneath, but you're, you're really not. You're looking through the oxide of chromium that protects the surface. And if you scratch it, the oxide forms so fast that uh, it immediately protects the underlying steel. Okay, um, so we can form alloys. Other alloys, um, let's see, uh, uh, brass, for instance. Brass is copper and nickel. And the copper will eventually corrode, but if you put a little nickel with it, it holds up a lot better in corrosive environments. So that's why a lot of the fixtures on, on ships 
due to the salt water spray that's constantly hitting them as made out of uh, brass. Okay, and it's stronger too. It's stronger than pure copper. Those These alloys, they're usually, not always, but very often they're, they're stronger than the, uh, the free metal. All right. So which is the cathode? The cathode is the site of reduction. So the pipe is constantly being reduced and the magnesium is being oxidized. It's the anode. So the cathode is the buried pipe. All right. So back to electrolysis. When we force a current through a cell to drive the reaction in reverse, right, we are um, going in the non-spontaneous direction. And our example here is the electrolysis of water. If you drive a direct current through water, then you can, you can split the uh, water molecule into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Okay, so which one is being reduced and which one is being oxidized? In that situation, when you go from water to hydrogen and oxygen, right, and we need uh, two here and two there, the oxygen is going from a two minus to a zero. So it's being oxidized. And the hydrogen is going from a plus one to a zero. It is being reduced. Right? So we're gaining electrons here and we're losing electrons here. Okay. So I used to have a device. Oh, I'm running out of time. Hold on a second. Let me check to be sure. Yeah, this is the last slide. So I can tell you, I used to have a piece of equipment uh, at another school I taught at that would do this procedure and capture the gases. Right? So it was, um, it had um, uh, two arms in it like this, like that. And in this side, we have an electrode. In this side, we have an electrode. Right? And it's, uh, we got solution in here. This is water. And we put just a little bit of uh, acid in it, like hydrochloric acid, to make the water conductive. Because pure water is an insulator. So we need something that would conduct the current. And we put um, uh, a negative charge on this side and a positive charge on that side. And we hook them to a battery. Okay. And we drive electrons going in here. So if electrons are going in there, and this is the gain part, this is the reduction part, then that one is going to produce hydrogen. Okay? And then uh, the positive side will take the electrons out, right? And that will oxidize the water to oxygen. So this side will have oxygen in it. And we can put, like, put a pair of tubes up there. Um, oxygen is a little more difficult to catch because it's about the same density as air. But hydrogen is much lighter than air. So it goes up here and you can catch it in that tube. Just hold it like that. And then you can take a, a glowing splint and just stick it in the end of the tube and it'll pop. <laughs> because it, it recombines with oxygen and air and uh, gives you that explosion. All right, so that's the last slide and that's the last of the material on um, redox reactions and um, electrochemistry. And next Thursday, we will take the review document and look at some problems. Uh, to prepare for the following Tuesday during a final exam week when you will have an exam on just this chapter.